To everyone who knows them, Lyle and Leslie Herring are a happy and successful couple. But what they don't know about is the trouble brewing in this marriage that will bring about horrific consequences. Leslie came from Guyana with her family as a child and built her American dream with persistence and hard work. And she comes from a close family of many talents. Her sister is actress Asha Davis. Their brother, Lyndon Telford says, Leslie was the rock solid one of the bunch, but always with a smile. She had zero tolerance for nonsense. And she was the organizer. She was definitely the mother hen. 44-year-old Leslie works a desk job at a home security company in Los Angeles. Her husband of 11 years, 56-year-old Lyle Herring, is a college recruiter at Cal State Northridge. All the women in our family says, well, you know, he's a special guy. While the men would say, there's something about this guy. He's up to something. We just can't put our finger on it. He's a smoozer. He's a keep your wives and girlfriends locked up kind of thing, you know? The couple live in an upscale condominium near Hollywood. To all appearances, it is a normal lifestyle. Until the day when both of them mysteriously disappear into thin air. When Asha, my sister, called and said, um, Leslie's job called and said that she didn't show up for work today. You know, 11 years, she never missed a day. So uh, we called Lyle to find out where Lyle and Leslie was. We couldn't find either one of them. Right away, Leslie's family is alarmed. Simply picking up and leaving town without a word to anyone is not her style. It went to a point like, oh my God, what happened? Were they abducted? Are they dead? Were they in a ditch line somewhere? Did they drown in their boat? They had a 60-foot um, sailboat that they used to take out. So maybe they drowned in their boat. No, no, we didn't know. We couldn't find them. Hollywood Police Department Detective Chris Gable presses ahead. The house looked uh, very clean, very nice. And except the couple of things that we noticed offhand was um, there was some spilled candle wax on the kitchen counter a pretty good amount as if a candle had spilt over. And what we were already learning about Leslie is that's not the kind of thing that she would just leave out on the counter. So that was a little unusual. Almost two weeks after the disappearance of the couple, police get a big break in the case. Lyle is stopped in his car by police as he crosses the Mexican border into the United States. We put an alert on his vehicle and on his driver's license. And so we went down there to speak to him at the border. When's the last time you saw your wife? Uh, that was Wednesday, so it was uh, Sunday morning. Have you tried to contact her? I haven't. Do you know where she is? I have no idea. She hasn't responded. Is that normal for her? Not to get in touch with you? Or respond to you? No, at this point, moving forward, I have nothing else to say. I have nothing about uh, where she is. They had plans to go to Rosarito for Valentine's Day. So he went down, and the reason he was in Mexico, according to Lyle, was to go down to search for her because that's where they had planned to go. Lyle later tells police he owed money to some shady characters who caught up with him and cut off his dreadlocks as punishment. I worked the gang unit for several years, and I've never, ever heard of some gang members holding someone down to uh, shave their head and shave their goatee off, you know, so that was a first. But police have no reason to keep Lyle detained. He goes back to his day job. And detectives go to work too, slowly connecting the dots, searching for Leslie and for any evidence of what happened to her. A letter they find in her bedside drawer shows that she's not happy about Lyle's money dealings either. In fact, she is furious and she wants out of this marriage. I can't take anymore. I'm broken. They also find her purse with her jewelry inside it, something she never leaves home without. She wore them everywhere. So we pulled a bunch of pictures of her wearing them out on the boats, wore them, I mean, parties. The only time she took them off is when, in, is when she went to bed and she put them in the nightstand. In Leslie's purse, along with her jewelry, cops find a receipt from a local Starbucks dated on a Tuesday night, four days after she went missing. So we thought, wow, Tuesday night, this is her purse. We'll go to Starbucks, see her on the video, see what's going on. Maybe her and Lyle are doing something. Um, so we go over there and we pull the video. They hustle over to Starbucks to check the surveillance tape before it is erased. And look who walks in. The receipt was in Leslie's purse, but who do they find making the purchase? We find out that it's 
it's Lyle by himself buying a single drink. Uh, Leslie's nowhere to be seen. So we thought that was pretty suspicious why that would be in there and, and, and we thought was that really you know, designed for us to find that? You know, maybe later down the road when the video wasn't available. Cops suspect Lyle may have planted the receipt in Leslie's purse as a misdirection. They turn to his personal computer and cell phone to see what else they can find. And what they come up with only deepens their concerns. Online searches for things like profile of a mass murderer, violent death and the soul, and 10 common methods of suicide. And only days after Leslie's disappearance, another mystery. There were several calls between Leslie's phone and Lyle's phone. What he didn't think is that we would also track the cell tower usage and it showed that both phones were side by side uh, when they were doing the calls suggesting that he's holding one phone call on the other one. Police are rapidly coming to the conclusion that Lyle has done something to Leslie. But they need more evidence. Specifically, they need Leslie dead or alive. Or else, they might have no case at all. You know, in a typical murder case, Exhibit A is a photo of a dead body. Someone who's been shot, strangled, stabbed. Um, and in a case like this, you don't have that. Leslie Herring has been missing for weeks, and police still don't know her fate, but they fear the worst at the hands of her husband, Lyle. They ask Lyle to go before TV news cameras to plead for help in finding his missing wife. Cops figure it's an offer he can't refuse, and it will also help shake the trees for witnesses. If Leslie's out there listening to us, please give us a call, come home, let us know what's going on. I know we have a lot to talk about. Days later, police meet with Lyle's cousin, Malcolm. He says he talked to Lyle in front of his condo shortly after Leslie disappeared. Lyle was very distraught. Uh, he was saying things that were really off the wall, like he said that he was going to burn in hell for what he did to Leslie. So Malcolm thought, wow, this is, this is really strange. I need to go and see if Leslie's OK. So he thought, well, I'll ask to use the bathroom, you know? And so he asked Lyle, he says, hey, can I use the bathroom? And Lyle said, hmm, let me think about that. Nah, I don't think that's just a good idea. And from that point, Malcolm thought, wow, this, there's something really wrong here. And both bathrooms had numerous towels hanging up on them, and they were all, they were dry, but they were very wrinkled as if they were crunched together to sop up a flood or something. It leads to a possible shocking conclusion about Leslie's fate. One was really, really badly wet and molded. That's where they believed that he might have drowned her that night. That Saturday night, that night was the last time that Leslie ever, ever a breath of air in her life. That's what they believe, and I believe it too. If that's true, there's a body somewhere. And then, out of nowhere, a neighbor of Lyle's comes forward with an electrifying story about the night of Leslie's disappearance that leaves cops slack jaw. Around midnight, he saw Lyle uh, wheeling a dolly uh, way down the hallway to a far back elevator and on the dolly was a uh, carpet which he described rolled up wide enough to contain a body. Lyle had this crazed look on his face, he had a hoodie pulled up, he was sweating and he didn't even acknowledge the witness. Hard to believe we are talking about the same guy who was front and center at a vigil for his missing wife. Meanwhile, cops call in some backup. A four-legged detective named Indiana Bones. She's trained to find the scent of human remains. Cops have her check the trunk of Lyle's old Cadillac and in the back of his SUV. As it turned out, we, we got uh, a positive hit from the uh, cadaver dog in both of his vehicles. The cars are parked about 200 yards apart in separate garages at the condominium complex. Our theory was is that after he murdered her, uh, he took her down to his SUV and then he transferred her body over to an old vintage Cadillac that he owned. Puts her body in there, drives back to his condominium, and once he figures out what he's gonna do, he puts the body back into the Mitsubishi and uses the Mitsubishi to uh, discard her body. And that's why we got uh, decomposition hits in both vehicles. Things are not looking good for Lyle, but cops don't move in on him yet. They still have no body. And without that, they'll need every shred of evidence they can get to make a convincing case for murder. The hardest part about one of these investigations is, is proving that she's no longer around. 
Leaving no stone unturned, detectives put a tracking device on Lyle's car. And we did uh, live surveillance and GPS surveillance on Lyle in hopes that maybe he would visit the, uh, where he may have disposed the body just to get that warm and fuzzy that everything was okay. Sure enough, two days later, he leads them to a remote area in Griffith Park. Less than three miles away from his condo at around 6 a.m. in the morning. Gets out of the car. He walks into this area where there's a couple of dumpsters, walks around there, gets back in his car and drives away. They call in the expert to have a sniff. We went out there with uh, Indiana Bones and we got a positive hit on a dirt mound, which was maybe 15 feet from a um, dumpster. Cops get to work digging up the mound. They are only one shovel full of dirt away from cracking this case, but they find nothing. And even the fine work of Indiana Bones only goes so far. Couldn't confirm that that was her body because it's Griffith Park. A lot of, there's a lot of bodies that get dumped there. But it seemed to really sync up with everything that perhaps he backed his Mitsubishi in there, put her body on this dirt mound, and then transferred it to the dumpster. Those dumpsters go to our huge LA dump. And if that's the case, I don't think we'll ever recover her body. It's a maddening puzzle, missing only one crucial piece. With everything they now know, police are still dead certain that Lyle has done away with his wife. She was in that carpet, yeah, absolutely. After 14 months of an exhaustive investigation, police drive over to Lyle's office at Cal State Northridge, and they arrest him. He was shocked that he was arrested. We um, told him that someone Something happened to his car, so he'd come outside so it wouldn't be in front of everyone. Lyle is charged with murder. Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney Sam Hulefeld handles the prosecution. But there's still that one missing element. The obvious thing that's remarkable about this case is that there was no body. Most murders start and end with a body. And here we had to build a case without one. Whatever the odds against getting a conviction, the prosecution is absolutely certain of their findings. They can only hope the jury will see things the same way. Even without Leslie's body in this case, um, the amount of evidence pointing to Le uh, Lyle Herring's guilt was overwhelming. And after a three week long trial, the jury quickly arrives at a verdict. Lyle Herring, guilty of second degree murder and is sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. As far as the evidence being overwhelming, I mean, that, that's actually the comment of the uh, trial judge who presided over the trial after conviction at sentencing. Lyle went through plenty of effort to cover up his guilt. And according to Detective Gable, he almost succeeded. In fact, if he had simply stayed home and read a book, Gable says, there's a chance this murder may never have been solved. He would have been much better off if he did nothing. Then we'd have nothing to go on. It was his cover-ups that really solidified the case. As for Leslie, she may never be found. But the police and her bereaved family still have hope that Lyle might do the right thing for once. Finding her remains will be uh, very important. So, and the only person that can do that is Lyle. Hopefully one day he'll will reach out to us and, and uh, want to tell us what, you know, where she is. We still don't believe it. We still cannot believe that this has happened. And the tragedy of this whole thing, we never found her remains. You know, her, her life impacted us and she'll always be in our hearts and souls and minds forever, forever, ever and ever and ever and ever.